In this video, I plan to give an overview of um, hypothesis testing on the mean. So we're looking at one quantitative variable when we do this. And this is just intended to be an outline to give you kind of a global picture for what hypothesis testing really looks like. So first off, a hypothesis test is um, a test where we're evaluating a claim or a statement about a population parameter. And the hypothesis testing procedure, it's a procedure to determine whether or not there is evidence to support the uh, claim about the population parameter or there's um, evidence against the claim about the population parameter. And in hypothesis testing, we use sample statistics to make an inference about population parameters. And we do this by applying some probability theory. So let's take a look at uh, the hypothesis testing procedure globally. Um, I like to do it in five steps. Um, I'm going to give you a rough idea of what those five steps are. Um, first, we start off with verifying the assumptions. Uh, then we state the null and the alternative hypothesis for the situation. We calculate the test statistic and the p-value. Then we uh, use the decision rule to make a, a decision regarding our null hypothesis. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to state a conclusion. So let's take a look at each of these steps um, uh, individually and, and see a little bit more about those steps. So first off with the assumptions, these are the assumptions or the conditions that are specific to the one sample uh, t-test on the mean. So first off, um, I always think about it is the assumptions are a series of questions that we ask ourselves in order to select the most appropriate test for the information that's given. And so we have to satisfy these conditions or these assumptions in order to do the one sample t-test. First off, um, the one sample t-test is dealing with one quantitative variable, and we have to have a defined population mean that we're trying to uh, test or learn something about. Um, number two, uh, we use data uh, from a random sample, and that's pretty important because we're trying to make sure, number one, that the sample is representative of the population where we're getting the data from. And then number two, we wanna make sure that everything in that sample is equally likely to be chosen. So in other words, we're trying to reduce or eliminate bias with this randomization process. The third condition that we have to meet is, is this, is the sample size large enough? Uh, most textbooks will use a sample size of at least 30. I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but typically we want a sample size of 30 or larger in order to use the one sample t-test. And if we don't satisfy the sample size condition, we can check to see if the population distribution is approximately normal. And this may sound a little weird, um, checking the population distribution, especially if uh, we only took a sample. Well, if we did a good job of randomizing uh, the data that we collected, took some sort of a random sample, it should be representative of the population. And we can take a look at that population distribution and see if it meets the guidelines to be approximately normal. So we're looking for um, things like the box plot, I think would be one of the important graphics to look at. You can certainly look at the histogram, but we have to be careful with that. We have sample sizes that are um, small. Um, I would say with a histogram you really want sample sizes that are more than 30, but the characteristics that we might look for is one is symmetry. We want to make sure that the distribution appears to be symmetric. In other words, there's no skewness. Um, number two, we want to check to make sure that there's no outliers that are going to cause undue influence on our mean or standard deviation when we use that to calculate the test statistic. And then probably the third one is we want to um, check and see if the data appears to be um, unimodal. And then the last thing, and this is specific to the one sample t-test, is uh, in this case, the population standard deviation would be unknown. So if we meet these conditions right here, this is saying, yeah, we can do a one sample um, hypothesis test on the mean, and we can use the t-distribution. So the next thing that we'd move into is stating our null and our alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis, which we typically denote h sub zero, is a statement that contains equality. Um, it implies that there's really no difference between those two things. Um, when we go through and do this, um, I, I'm not going to talk about the fail to disprove right now, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so the alternative hypothesis uh, is typically denoted H sub 1 or H sub A, and the alternative hypothesis is a statement that contains strict inequality. If you look at the right of the slide, you'll see I gave an example there. So H sub 0 could be mu is greater than or equal to 20. Maybe. Um, we're looking at age, for example, and we're looking at incoming students at uh, a local college. And we believe that the average age of incoming students is under 20. 
Well, if I had that that I was evaluating, I'd be looking at h sub a, mu is less than 20. We're, we we want to check to see if the average age is actually under 20. And then h sub 0, I'm just using the complement rule of that, and that would be the average age is at least 20, so 20 years of age or older. And we'll get to writing hypothesis statements for a given scenario a little bit later on. So we'll use that kind of to springboard through some of the other stuff. So in step three, we have two parts, or at least I usually do this in two parts. We look at the level of significance, that's our alpha value. Typically, this is determined before we go and gather any data, and it's determined by um, either the researcher or you're, it's determined with some sort of team that's doing this research prior to collecting the data. What is the level of significance that we want to use? And this represents the probability of committing what's called type 1 error, which is a false positive. Again, I'm not going to get into the details about this, but typical alpha values are 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.10. And I'd say most textbooks predominantly use 0 0.05 as the alpha value. The other part of step three is we have to calculate a test statistic and a p-value. In the test statistics, what we're, we're doing is we're comparing um, a sample value that we got to a hypothesized value for the population parameter that we're, we're taking a look at, and we divide that by basically the variability, which um, you can kind of see in these two equations right there. So uh, the, the first one that I want to look at, if we knew what the population standard deviation was, we'd be using the z-distribution. We're not going to be using this in class. We're not really focusing, this on, focusing on this in class, but I want to make you aware of that. All right. So with the z-distribution, we, we have to know the population standard deviation. And if you look at this equation, it uses sigma in there. That's not always um, uh, very relevant for most practices. We might not know what the population standard deviation is. And when we use the z-distribution, we have to use the normal CDF function if you're using a TI-83 or 84 graphing calculator. And with that normal CDF, we have to input our lower bound, our upper bound, and then we're going to be on standard units, so z units, so the mean would be 0 and the standard deviation would be 1. This test statistic is either our lower bound or our upper bound depending on what our alternative hypothesis is, okay? Um, and then we're going to focus on this if the population standard deviation is unknown. This is when we use the t-distribution. And we'll focus on the t-distribution in class. But to calculate the test statistic, uh, we're comparing our sample mean to our population mean in the, in the numerator. So really, we're looking at how different those things are. And really, the bigger the difference between the sample mean and the population mean, the more evidence we have against our null hypothesis. And the closer those two are together, the less evidence we have against our null hypothesis. And then below, we're dividing this by s over the square root of n, which some of you may recall is the standard error. And when we calculate the p-value for this test statistic, we have to use the tcdf function because we're using the t-distribution. And the inputs for this would be the lower bound, the upper bound, and df stands for the degrees of freedom, uh, which is n minus 1 in our case. So um, the lower bound or the upper bound, this test statistic will be one of those two values right there. And again, that depends on the alternative hypothesis. In step four, we have to make a decision regarding the null hypothesis. And we do this by comparing the p-value to the alpha value. Um, and we say uh, the, the general rule that we use, and we'll use this all the time, if our p-value is smaller than our alpha value, then we reject our null hypothesis. Um, some, some texts will use if the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha value, then we reject our null hypothesis. But generally, that's what we use, okay? Um, and then um, at the end of this, we're going to have to make a decision and state why we rejected the null hypothesis or why we failed to reject the null hypothesis. And that goes back to comparing the p-value and the alpha value. So below, I'm giving you a picture to kind of show you what the alpha, look, alpha value looks like in the rejection region and then the fail to reject region with the 1 minus alpha value in there. And I drew this specifically for the example that I gave on, on the uh, third slide of this PowerPoint where I said h sub a was mu is less than 20. So again, we'll get into the details of all this uh, when we get into an example. There is another way that we can use the decision rule. It's called the critical value approach, and that's where we compare um, a test statistic to a, um, a t value that we get based on our alpha value and our degrees of freedom. We're not going to focus on the critical value approach in this class. We're going to focus on the p value approach, which I have um, written out in this uh, decision rule for step four. 
once we make our decision regarding our null hypothesis, we're going to state some sort of conclusion. I like using kind of generic can statements where you just fill in the blanks just to make things a little bit easier. Obviously, it can be a little bit more elaborate than this. Um, but when I, when I write my conclusion um, in class or um, in examples, I'm going to say there is or there is not sufficient evidence to support that. The big blank right there that you see after the that, um, I'm going to usually use that to represent H sub A. Typically, our claim about a population parameter is regarding H sub A, not all the time, but um, we want to state something about that and specific about it. What does H sub A really represent? Um, and then we're going to finish with on average in the population just to get, get at the idea that we're making an inference about the population. Okay, So I'll leave it at that and we'll take a look at some examples a little bit later on. Hopefully this gives us a general idea of what the, the hypothesis testing procedure looks like and gives us a general idea about hypothesis testing in general.